The state of Oklahoma, once the largest producer of oil in the world, has a long and rich history in oil production. At the turn of the last century, oil magnates such as Harry Sinclair and J. Paul Getty learned the business and made their first millions in the Oklahoma Glen Pool oil field struck in 1905. It was at that time the richest oil field in the world and made Tulsa, Oklahoma the undisputed oil capital of the world. Today, modern technologies and new drilling techniques are enabling oil companies to return to wells once thought dry and recover new reserves. Swan Energy is continuing in that adventurous entrepreneurial spirit. Director of Exploration for Swan Energy, John Herring, takes us from the center of Oklahoma City to the oil fields of McLean County in search of Oklahoma crude. McLean County is a pretty special place in the oil field. It's been developed over the last hundred years. Uh, one of the highest success rates probably onshore U.S. as a county. Uh, over 90% of the wells that have been drilled have been completed and found oil. And a lot of the other 10% that were deemed dry holes we're going back into because they weren't really dry holes. They might have been drilled in a time of low oil prices and now we can go in and make them economical. So it's a pretty tough thing to do to drill a dry hole in McLean County. Um, and the upside's really neat. Uh, the area is defined by some pretty complex geology, but when it all gets said and done, what you've got is you've got some of the best onshore U.S. reservoirs. Um, in the Wilcox series of sands. Locally, they call them the bromides. Um, there's million barrel wells to three million barrel wells that have been drilled in the bromides. Wells that come on over a thousand barrels of oil a day. Um, vertically, that's almost unheard of anymore. Typically, to get that type of production, you gotta drill a horizontal well. You can still make really big oil wells vertically in McLean County. The safety of McLean County comes from the backup zones. There's Hunt and Viola limestones as well as some D sandstones that you're, you, you're always going to hit the Hunt and Viola. They're certainly always saturated with oil. Um, it's just a matter of using the right stimulation technique to get it out. So even if we miss a bromide well, we can go make a really nice Hunt and Viola well um, and get a good rate of return. So from our perspective as an oil company, we go out and put leases together and put land together and drill wells and develop fields and we're able to go out and drill good wells and HBP acreage, hold it by production that is, and add to our asset base. From an investor's point of view, they're coming into an area that's really safe. Like I said, it's really going to be hard for me to drill a dry hole and we have the upside potential of drilling 5 to 10 to 20 to 1 type return on our investment wells. So. From an uh, onshore U.S. perspective, this is one of the best plays I've ever been involved in and quite frankly one of the best plays that I've seen um, work from a vertical standpoint. In 1859, Lewis Ross struck oil while deepening his salt well near Neosho Crossing on Grand River in the Cherokee Nation. Jacob Bartles, who gave his name to the oil center of Bartlesville, noticed oil seeping out of the ground when he marched through the region with the 6th Kansas Cavalry during the Civil War. Nearly 40 years later, on April 15, 1897, near Bartlesville, the first commercial oil well in what is now the state of Oklahoma, the Nellie Johnstone No. 1, blew in as a gusher. Nellie Johnstone was the Delaware maiden who owned the land where the well was discovered. The well produced over 100,000 barrels of crude oil before it was plugged in 1948. The success of the Nellie Johnstone stimulated exploration and drilling on the nearby Osage lands. Brothers Frank and L.E. Phillips, attracted by the oil boom, moved from Iowa to Bartlesville in 1904. They hit a gusher north of Bartlesville, followed by 80 straight producers. The two founded Phillips Petroleum Company in 1917. It grew to become Bartlesville's largest employer and one of the nation's top oil companies. We've arrived here in McLean County. We're on site of the Rosie Fapiano 118 well. Drilling it to approximate depth of 13,000 feet. They're currently drilling at 9,700. The rig we're using is Beredco Rig 8. We're going to spend a little time today going around talking about the components of this drilling rig and what goes into drilling a well here in the 
part of oil and gas country in McLean County, Oklahoma. First thing we're going to talk about today on the drilling rig is the mud system. It's the lifeblood of drilling an oil well. Um, behind me we've got mud tanks and to my left we've got the generators running the mud pumps. The mud system in oil and gas is used for a myriad of reasons. They put it in here in the hopper, it gets mixed up into our mixing tank right outside and then sent over to our reserve mud tanks. Uh, from there it's going to get pumped through the mud pumps and up to the rig and down the drill string and out the drill bit. That mud coming out the drill bit serves multiple functions. First of all, it cools the drill bit while we're drilling. It brings the cuttings to the surface. And third and probably most importantly, it keeps oil and gas or any hydrocarbons down in the earth from coming up to the surface. So your mud has to be in balance. And what I mean by balance is if your mud's too heavy, it'll go south into the hole and you'll lose mud. If the mud's too light, it'll allow reservoir fluids to come into the wellbore and come to the surface and you can have a really big disaster, catch rigs on fire, such like that. So mud is the most critical component of drilling an oil and gas well. If your mud's too thick, you'll drill slow. If your mud's too thin, it's not gonna cut, bring cuttings to the surface. They test their mud a few times a day. A mud engineer comes out in the morning and does a daily mud report and gives the recipe. There's 50, 60 different additives at least that you can add to plain water to make up what we call drilling mud. That engineer is going to come out every morning, run his tests, and come up with a daily recipe and tell the rig hands what shape he wants the mud in and what they need to add and what stages um, to make a proper mud. So that's a little brief explanation of a mud system on a drilling rig, but really it is a lifeblood of drilling any oil well. On November 22nd, 1905, Wildcatters Robert Galbraith and Frank Chesley struck oil on the Oklahoma Creek Indian Reservation near Tulsa. The well they were drilling was named the Ida E. Glen No. 1, after the Creek Indian woman who owned the land. The well blew in over the derrick with a gusher flowing 75 barrels of oil per day. It was Oklahoma's first major oil field and the richest field the world had yet seen. Bob and Frank named the Glen Pool after Ida. Within two years, pipelines had been laid up from the Texaco and Gulf refineries on the Gulf Coast and down from the Standard Oil Refinery in Kansas to access the high quality crude. Dozens of other refineries were built in the Tulsa area. That same year, 1907, Oklahoma became a state. During that year, Oklahoma produced more oil than any other state in the United States and any other country in the world. The small railroad stop Tulsa had become the undisputed oil capital of the world. We're here in the doghouse of Redco Rig 8. This is where the driller spends a lot of his time. This is his report sheet. Writes down his 12 hour shift, exactly what he does every hour and what the rig's doing. Um, it's got all your information about what kind of BHA or a bottom hole assembly you've got in the hole from bits to drill collars to drill string and what depth they're at. You've got a bit, a bits of drill collars, the jar, and then drill pipe. i tell you exactly how long that bottom hole assembly is, 502.86 feet, and then drill pipe behind it. What they're going to log here is time from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So from 6 p.m. last night to 11 p.m. they were drilling. They did a rig service and they continued drilling. They keep it manually. They also keep it on computer. The manual is sometimes a good double check for the computer and vice versa. The computer he's got here, he's going to monitor lots of different stuff with this computer. He's going to monitor the RPMs, how fast that bit's turning. He's going to measure the weight on the bit and see how much weight he's putting on the bit. He's going to see how fast it's drilling. The strokes per minute, how many strokes the mud pumps are going, so how much mud and total volume he's pumping every minute. The standpipe pressure, what the pressure of the mud system is in, in the standpipe here. These are all the things that he watches. These have alarms on them. If anything gets out of a certain range that he sets, an alarm will go off and alert him that he needs to pay attention to what he's drilling. Right here, this is the auto driller. With this button right here, he can adjust the amount of weight on the bit that the rig will put on it automatically while it's drilling. Um, this way he doesn't have to stand out there with his 
hand on the rig handle, constantly drilling the well. The rig does a lot of the work for him. The other big use of this room is rest and relaxation. People might think drilling's really fun and pretty exciting. It's really not. Um, currently, we're drilling about six foot an hour. We drill 30 feet at a time, so it's gonna be five hours between times when they have to add a new piece of pipe in. Adding a new joint of pipe only takes two to four minutes. So you got five hours of downtime for two to four minutes worth of work. It gives these guys a lot of time to clean the rig, paint it, that's why the rig looks so nice. They also spend a lot of time in here drinking coffee and eating junk food. Um, pretty good two staples on a rig are uh, hot dogs and coffee, and they usually have a lot of them. This doghouse is kind of like the locker room um, in a sports analogy. This is where the team kind of meets every morning or every evening. They come here first, they have their safety meetings here, they eat their meals here, they do a lot of their drilling here. There's an air conditioner in the summer and there's a heater in the winter. Um, this is their home away from home and they spend a lot of time here on the rig. And that, those are the basic purposes of a doghouse. The town of Cushing, Oklahoma's oil era began on March 17, 1912, when wildcatter Thomas B. Slick brought in a gusher on the Frank M. Wheeler farm nine miles east of town. Word quickly spread, and explorers and oil workers rushed into the area. Wells were drilled everywhere, and of the first 46, only one proved a dry hole. Eventually, 23 oil companies and five oil field supply houses located there. The Cushing Field became one of the greatest oil discoveries of the early 1900s, producing 300,000 barrels a day by 1915. By 1919, the Cushing Drum Ride area accounted for 17% of U.S. and 3% of world production of oil, becoming known as the Pipeline Crossroads of the World. We're standing here on the drilling floor of Bareco Rig 8. Just to my right is the control panel. Controls all the rig functions as far as moving the pipe up and down, the RPMs you're turning it at. Behind that is the weight sensors, telling you how much weight you got on the bit, how much weight's on the hook load. You'll notice nobody else is out here with me. Just like your car has cruise control, this rig drills on auto. They set the rig to drill at a certain weight on the bit, the rig figures it out and adds weight as it's needed. The squeaking you might hear behind you are the rig brakes. Every time it squeaks, it's letting a little more pipe into the hole. It's a good way that these guys know the rig's working right. That squeak gets a nice little monotone to it, and if it's working right, it sounds the same all the time. What you see spinning on the floor is the rotary table and the Kelly in the rotary table. And behind it, the little piece of pipe you see sticking up, that's the next piece of pipe we're gonna add to this drill string. We're currently drilling just almost 10,000 feet, so two miles of pipe in the ground. Let me do it 30 feet at a time. Kelly drills 30 feet, pick up the next piece of pipe, drill another 30 feet. From the yellow part down to the Kelly bushing right here that sits in the table and that's what turns it, that's always constant. They're gonna make a connection which we're gonna be able to see here shortly. They've almost done drilling this 30 foot section. Um, there's a piece of pipe standing vertically in what they call the mouse hole, the next piece of pipe there. They'll come pick up that piece of pipe, put it in the string and start drilling pick up this next one, put it in the mouse hole, and rig up the next one. So they've always got their pipe ready to go for their next connection. They'll go up, they'll go back down, and then they'll make their connection. They've got these strapped out. They'll come out here and measure these to the hundredth of a foot. So they've got a tally. They already know each one of these pipes is in order. They know exactly how long it is, so they know which piece of pipe's going in, how long it is. They keep it on paper, exactly where the bit depth is. They also put it into the computer to keep a tally, and it figures it out too. And they're not always right. I mean, there's been times where they say, well, the hole's at 12,000 feet, and you go log it, and it's at 90 feet off. They've missed three joints of pipe somewhere in their tally. They can be short or long. So um, it's, not, it's not a perfect science, knowing where you're at all the time. It looks fancy, and they report it to a hundredth of a foot, but they can be 90 feet off. Drilling, people might think it's kind of exciting. It's not. It's pretty boring. I mean, they're going to do work every six hours, and then they got six hours, and that's why their rig's brand newly painted, and their doghouse is painted, and they do a lot of scrubbing, a lot of cleaning, and a lot of rig maintenance all day long. 
So they've just added in their next piece of pipe and they're gonna go back down to bottom, put the Kelly in, start turning and off to drilling. Five more hours, they'll do it again. The opening of the Hilton oil field in 1913 set into motion one of Oklahoma's greatest oil booms. By 1937, this field, the largest of nine such fields located in Carter County, had produced over two million barrels of oil, making it one of the most productive pools in the state. The first successful well was completed in August 1913 at the depth of only 920 feet. Oilmen streamed into the area as word of the discovery spread. By June 1914, an estimated 120 oil companies were actively searching for oil around Hildton. The shallow depth of the oil-bearing sands attracted smaller operators, reducing the amount of capital necessary to drill a well. This gave the Hildton area a reputation for being a poor man's field. We're here at the shaker. This is where the mud that got pumped down in the hole, brought the cuttings back up, comes to first. Um, you got Derek Man here doing a mud test right now. He's going to do what we call a funnel test. He's going to check the viscosity of the mud and find out the parameters. The mud comes through the shaker, a couple things it's going to do. The mud liquid's going to fall through the shaker. The cuttings are going to come off the end of the shaker. Those cuttings, we're going to analyze for the amount of oil and gas in them, whether it's a sandstone or a shale, a limestone. They're going to go to the mud logging trailer to be fertile or analyzed. The other neat piece of equipment right here is bright lime green. It's a gas sniffer. What it's doing is it's taking some of the mud and separating the gas out and sending it through some glycol, and they're reading how much gas is in the mud. When you drill through a zone that's full of oil and gas, you're gonna get an increase of gas in the mud that comes out. Um, so that's a first indication that we're in a zone that may hold oil and gas is when we get gas out of our sniffer. This piece of machinery, its main job is to separate solids from liquids. Get the solids, the cuttings we just drilled out of the mud, send it down to the reserve pit, take the liquids, back into the reserve mud so it can be pumped out. This is where the mud gets conditioned on this end and gets sent over to the mud pump. Now I'm gonna show you an example of the cuttings we get and how we analyze them here from the, the rock that we're cutting up. First thing we're gonna do is clean it. This is a sample of some of the cuttings that come up, that come across the shaker. Initially, what you can see here are these big flakes of black shale. Um, they, they break as much as they're cut when they're down to the bottom of the hole and they come up in these big chunks. You can see how they break and they're very brittle. It's a very brittle shale. It's a Springer shale. It's been drilled horizontally here, six miles to the east, and it's more of a horizontal producer than vertical, but um, it's certainly a hydro hydrocarbon bearing shale. Um, there's a little bit of sandstone, maybe a little bit of limestone in here, but for the most part, we're drilling through nice black shale. It's easy to drill, and um, it's a source rock where oil and gas is cooked, and then goes to reservoir rock. So uh, that's what we're seeing right here, is drilling about 90% shale, is what I'd call it, just looking at it in my hand. The Wild Mary Sudic was a famous Oklahoma gusher in the Oklahoma City field that received national attention when it was drilled in 1930 by the Indian Territory Illuminating Oil Company on the Vince and Mary Sudic farm. The well blew out when the drilling crew failed to properly weight the mud in the hole on March 26, 1930, reaching a peak rate of 72,000 barrels a day. It took 11 days to cap the well and oil rained down throughout the region. Time Magazine reported in the April 14, 1930 issue, in Oklahoma City last week, housewives took clothes in from lines, shut their windows, industrial plants warned their firemen to be ready to bank furnaces on a moment's notice. In outlying towns, men looked into the sky and cursed when a change of wind suddenly brought a downpour of fine-blown oil.
After two unsuccessful attempts, the Wild Mary was finally capped on April 6, 1930. There would eventually be 13 wells on the Sudic lease, and tens of millions of barrels of oil would be drawn from it, some of the wells produced for over 40 years. Vince and Mary Sudic became wealthy beyond imagination from the royalties paid. We're looking at now is the reserve pit. We have one of these pits on every location. It's a working pit. Our cuttings, our bad mud, anything like that goes in the reserve pit. When we're done with this well, we'll get trucks to come suck the reserve pit dry, fill it back in, and it'll look good as new. A lot of people may worry that he got mud cuttings here and we might contaminate soils. Turns out this will probably be the greenest spot in the entire county next year because all these minerals and stuff that we're bringing up and depositing in here are absolutely fantastic for the soil and for, and for future growth. So this will probably be the most fertilized spot in McLean County other than the other reserve pits that we've drilled out here. The early history of the Oklahoma oil fields is rich. In fact, Oklahoma is the only state in the Union with an oil well on the Capitol grounds. While the oil boom of the last century is long over, the future of the industry continues to be bright, as today, oil companies like Swan Energy are continuing in that adventurous entrepreneurial spirit, returning to those fields once thought to be spent with new technologies to recover that precious commodity in their search for Oklahoma crude.